All right, thank you very much. Uh, we are, yeah, very pleased to be here. Uh, Rob mentioned we did our first show in New York. That was more of a kind of like comedy club atmosphere, I think. The ceilings were lower, there were no windows. This is, I guess, for the listeners at home, more of a kind of, I don't know, some cross between an art gallery and a beer hall. Very Berlin, I guess, in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to do. Um, First, yeah, just a, quick, a bit of structural uh, notes here. We're going to do uh, three segments, uh, uh, and two of them will be our kind of standard length uh, analytical segments. We're going to be talking about the U.S. debt ceiling crisis, and then the German uh, Ampelregierung, the German government in international perspective and what the rest of the world is making of the German government. Uh, and then we we're going to do uh, uh, a Q&A. We're going to set aside plenty of time for that. Uh, so you might want to start thinking of some questions. Uh, and yeah, the only constraint there is that Adam will need to leave uh, pretty promptly after we finish here. Um, he will be going directly to a, a television studio to do the Maybrit Ilna show, which will be... Um, <laughs> Hence the silly suit. Yes, exactly. That's uh, why he's overdressed here for Neukölln. He's actually wearing a suit in this uh, part of town. Otherwise, uh, I think it's banned around here. But um, uh, anyway, um, uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, Adam is a kind of German celebrity now, as uh, that attests to. So I thought the first segment should be a bit about Adam's relationship to Germany. Uh, he, uh, you all know him here in Germany and the role he plays in public life. I thought we could interrogate that a bit in a sort of classic podcast style. Um, I don't really have a data point. I, d I don't know what that would have been. Uh, I mean, it could have, I thought it could be zwei, because uh, that is the German word for two, which kind of sounds like twos, uh, but I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use that. Um, but um, yeah, I did want to ask you, Adam, um, most people here have probably heard you speak German, and uh, it is remarkable uh, because it's at a native speaker level, practically. I speak German, I think of myself as pretty fluent, but there is a still gap there between sort of fluency and kind of that native speaker level. So yeah, why are you such a native speaker? I mean, wh wh where does that come from exactly? Uh, well, it's not from any particular linguistic talent, for sure. Um, I was moved to Germany, to Heidelberg, when I was uh, seven. Uh, um, in um, early, 70, uh, early 74. Um, so I have memories of the Arab-Israeli war, mm. of that fall in uh, British Sunday supplements. So I know it was after that. Well, you can tip your hand. How old were <laughs> you in 1974? Yeah, well, I, was, well, I was seven, and I okay. was really into military history, and there were all these amazing things about the Bar Lev line. And, and um, anyway, that was in Britain. Then moved to West Germany, a very different scene. And... Uh, Started German high German school the following um, following autumn, and then went through a series of German schools. Kind of a crash course. Seventy three, seventy four was the first year that the Federal Republic admitted um, foreign kids to its schools. So the Gastarbeiter children were eingeschult in that first year, along with me. Okay. And we can honestly say that um, yeah, German schools were not ready for us. Um, there, well, there wasn't much of a concept of. Uh, teaching German as a, foreign, as a foreign language. It was kind of astonishing. So I was fully literate by that point, because in England we started school at four. So I was reading, you know, Harry Potter's like, big books, but didn't know a word of German. And German turns out to be phonics. So I was in this village classroom with all these illiterate kids, you know, just charging through whatever German they gave me and not understanding a word of what I was reading. <laughs> uh, so it was a, it was a really formative, formative mm. experience of, of linguistic dysphoria. Yeah, but... Uh, was in uh, German high school through to Zinterklasse and then became a, a mig an educational migrant. Okay, so there you go. Yeah. Adam Tews was a Gastarbeiter uh, of, a type, of a type. Uh, I uh, think uh, no, there's a new phrase, Mensch, you know, mit, yeah. Mensch mit Migrationshintergrund. That's, yeah. the, uh, that's what I discovered I was. Yeah. And okay, so that, that does make sense. Arrived at seven, gained fluency, we're here through, through school, those formative sister, years. Because she was two when we moved. She doesn't remember not speaking German. And my German friends always tease me that her German is way better than mine and always will be. Because mm. she just, you know, that, that, the five-year gap is really very significant at that stage. So that was Heidelberg, but mm. you also have a, specifically a relationship to Berlin, right? I mean, yeah. you lived here for a time. I mean, mm. w w w when was that and whereabouts exactly in Berlin were you living? It was just sort of typical Vessi behavior. So I... You know, I did like a terrible sausage factory English 
undergraduate degree, got spat out of Cambridge, um, and didn't have any didn't have any sense really of having any space to grow up at all um, because you were just doing exams, 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 exams. And um, you know, all of my you know, all the people from my yagang in in Heidelberg were taking their sweet time about growing up, and one of the places they were doing that was here. This being the only serious city in Germany. Hmm. And um, you know, if you have London, which I was, <laughs> like you, you can tell the difference. And this is a serious city, sort of. And and so so it was, you know, a kind of natural draw. Um, and I moved here immediately after finishing in Cambridge without you know, graduating. And I think in uh, May '89. Hmm. Uh, so then, May as 89. a you know, somebody quite committed to the West German version of what hmm. West Berlin was. And then, of course, everything changed very dramatically. But I always lived in the west part of town. Um, Wilmersdorf, Schöneberg, that kind of... Did you ever venture to Neukölln at that time? Yeah, no, yeah, that wasn't Neukölln, really absolutely. Okay, but sure. when it was yeah. a rather different kind of yeah, place, actually. You know, yeah, it was really quite different in the, in the early 90s. And where were you in 1989? Obviously, the wall falls. What were you doing I was in, at that I moment? Actually, this is the tragic story of uh, you know, the world, world before the internet. As I'd had a long, hard day in the library. It was a cold day. I came home, remember, put myself in the bath, had the world service on, and there was all this crazy talk about the wall coming down, and I turned the bloody radio off <laughs> and, and went to bed. Um, you assumed so, it was fiction. So like you assumed most it was people, okay. I, mean, you I know, see. Most people in the city were not there, like, you've, you know, because you actually had to be like watching TV, mm. and and so if you weren't in that crowd, you didn't. And I have to say, as a as somebody, as a Menschmann begotten Hintergrund, who'd grown up in the Federal Republic, really, and I keep calling it that, Bundesrepublik, not hmm. Deutschland. And that's what I really liked, right, was this post-national Habermasian kind of conception. The day the wall fell here changed my view of Germany, like it did many people's, in that same position, right? Hmm. So it was a real shock to suddenly encounter this completely authentic, totally, of course, valid as well, deeply emotional experience of a kind of patriotism and in Berlin family reunification I, I literally went to the library the following day okay. almost as a kind of refusal of the moment and this librarian looked at me and said what the hell are you doing here and broke down in tears and at that point I thought okay fine you, know, you should probably go see this but there was a but there was a there was a it was clearly mm. not our party it was not necessarily the migrants party in, in, in Germany. And if you look back as a historian, it's astonishing. The Greens, Oscar Lafontaine's SPD, campaigned in the subsequent election on a unification skeptical line. Hmm, so, which, yeah. was, which was, you know, if you came from the deepest southwest of the Bundesrepublik, you know, there were things you would rather not have to deal with. And those included reunification and all of these, hmm. the East German brothers and sisters who if you were in the Ostpolitik, Willy Brandt kind of camp, which we, my family definitely was, you had given up on, right? This was not the project. As I, recently, I tweeted it out. Hans Ulrich Wähler came to Yale in the spring of 89 and gave a lecture to the German studies community on why Germany must remain divided. And that was very much my kind of scene. Hmm. You know, so yeah, no. no animosity. It was just, you know, <laughs> hang on, we've processed this, we've done this. And I came from a you know, British leftist position at that point, you know, really quite a far leftist position. So looking at it, you could kind of see how the chips were going to fall. You mm. know, the, 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 the Rundertisch, the, all of these sort of attempts to create civil rights, human rights based, civil liberties based liberal positions were clearly just going to get swept away by capital and the Christian Democrats. And that is, you know, it's one of my... Mm. One, of my, one of my better political calls mm. um, was to see <laughs> that coming. Because you were very unpopular in... Berlin circles at that point, if you went to a kind of, you know, capitalism position and said, look, this is the driving force here. How far left were you? Were you on the barricades in I was Kreuzberg, a, I was May a 1st? How should we picture I, you I at that time? Like, not in, no, but there was no space for that here. So I was a flat out newspaper selling SWP okay. trot. Like, there we really, go. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's, to, you know, it was, a, it was an education. Mm. I'm going to do Marxism, you know, the SWP's conference this summer remotely, unfortunately, but... Mm. Alex Kalinikos is somebody I have quite a lot of time for, despite the internal politics of the SWP, which one shouldn't take lightly, because that was a, a mess at the end, but um, terrible mess. Um, but um, yeah, no, that tradition of you know the politics of the book within Marxism, which is what the SWP still embodied at that point, um, was very uh, yeah quite formative for me. Okay, so 
at some point you fled Germany, I guess maybe because of reunification. I'm picturing you just decided no. to leave the country. <laughs> no, no, not until the mid-90s. Okay, and then, <laughs> but then you obviously have been living elsewhere. You live in New York now. I mean, are there parts of Germany, German culture that you particularly miss? Are there parts of Germany maybe that you don't miss? I mean, what, 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 do, you, what do you make of German culture and uh, uh, German, German life these days? I don't know. I'm mean, as deeply dipped as like, I was. I kind of go to the Angela Merkel position here when she was asked, what does she like about Germany? She gave a long pause and she said, you know, particularly airtight windows. Yeah, good um, windows. And I kind of, I appreciate, that's kind of, that's, I mean, she was in East German, obviously, but that's a good Bundesrepublik answer. Like, you know, a, you know the TÜV is a really, no, it's, a, it's a good <laughs> institute. No, it's a, bit, it's a bit constraining of, you know, of hot rodding, but <laughs> broadly speaking, it's good for car safety. Um, <laughs> Yeah, obviously. Now I get I uh, yeah, I do actually. I miss seasons. I, I miss I miss. Hmm. I, I get totally. I do get sentimental about Europe around Christmas, to be honest. Because, hmm. um, but I can't. I oh. can't. I can't actually. I can't. Uh, I, you know, I can't be without Europe for long periods of time. Hmm. I, need, I need to come back and. and um, don't tell me you missed the German, the Berlin winter. That, that, I mean, no, that sort of. You don't no, say, okay, no, yeah. it's a particularly grim one. No, I prefer New York. Yeah, Just, you know, um, a bit good cold snap. Um, yeah. This is the time of year to be here, surely. Um, uh, okay, well, I figure we could uh, uh, switch gears here now to um, talk about uh, the debt ceiling crisis I mentioned. I do have a data point there. Uh, specifically. Yeah, I should say I insisted on this. I thought we should definitely talk about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was going to say, uh, um, yeah, this was Adam's uh, idea. And I, you know, from as far as I, I can tell, Germans were not talking about it. I watched the Tagesschau uh, sometimes. It was not appearing there. But I will say on the way here, I saw in the Berliner Fenster in the, in the U-Bahn where they give headlines. For the first time, I saw a reference to the debt ceiling crisis. So, yeah, perhaps good timing. Um, yeah. I should say the production team is worried, too. So we need to get the episode out by... Yes, Tomorrow. it will. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Another they reason like, they need to be punctual because God knows what happens by next week. They were going to take their time. We're like, no, yeah. this has to come out by tomorrow. Who knows what will happen? So uh, kudos the data, to them. Yeah. The data point specifically is $31.4 trillion. That is the current U.S. debt limit. Um, so, yeah, just very quickly, the basics on this. Uh, uh, you know, the debt ceiling is this kind of American curiosity. Like the United States, like every other country in the world, passes laws about spending, what kind of spending obligations the country has on the military, on education, on Social Security, all those kinds of things. Uh, um, you know, most countries in the world, you have to, uh, you know, spend your tax revenue and make up the gap with by borrowing money. Um, the difference is in the United States, there is an additional law called the debt ceiling, which sets a limit on how much the United States can borrow. And so we periodically get these crises where, um, you know, the commitments to spending are contradicted by the limits on borrowing. And yeah, no other country in the world really does this. Denmark has a debt limit, but it's nowhere near their spending uh, 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 commitments. So the United we States actually, is... No, we actually did an episode about this the this last is... time around. We've been running this show for long enough now. The, no, the no, last... no, no, no. Th not only that. It was our yeah. very first episode was on the debt ceiling. Right. I don't know if it was our well, very, very first episode. Exactly. There, go exactly. Go so back, we're all going back full circle. A... Yeah. Our very first episode a year and a half or so ago was on the debt ceiling. And here we are again. Um, so yeah, we basically, the United States might be in default soon. It can't pay its bills. And yeah, this happens occasionally with countries. Sri Lanka had a default uh, last year. We did a segment on that. But you know, this was not a global crisis when Sri Lanka went into default. Uh, with America, it's a different story. If America goes into bankruptcy, essentially, it could be a kind of global catastrophe. And I guess I wanted to kind of figure out why exactly that's the case. Uh, and it seems like the thing that connects the two, that connects the kind of US a uh, uh, peculiar problem here with the debt ceiling and global financial catastrophe is the role played by U.S. debt. I guess I wanted to ask yeah. you, yeah, about this role. What is the role, the special role yeah. played by U.S. debt? It seems like the world's big financial institutions all hold on to U.S. debt and treat it as the equivalent of money. I mean, is that is that's that the key thing? Yeah. So the the debt serves as when when we talk about dollar dominance or you know the role of the dollar as a reserve currency, very few holders of substantial reserves when we're talking hundreds of billions or trillions are holding cash like you know what would you even do with it how would you even do that you could hold deposits of various types but what they mainly do is hold liquid assets and the most liquid dollar asset notionally most of the time is government debt um, because it's the biggest markets the deepest it's the most sophisticated and ultimately it's backstopped by the 
fed you know this is kind of contrary to popular discourse about public debt because most of the time i think people think of it as political and therefore risky and that's kind of one of the perverse quirks of public discussions of finance is that in fact the tax backed debt is the one which ultimately is the most general. I mean, I think that's the key idea. Like if Apple borrows right now, it gets a very, very good interest rate because it's Apple. But if you think about it longer term, say something bad happens with China or the next iPhone sucks or something like that, Apple's ability to repay goes away. If you talk about the American government, so long as the f politics continues to function, in other words, it can raise taxes, there's going to be an Apple, an Apple successor, and other companies alongside, and it can tax those, and therefore, ultimately, the revenue flow is more generic, and therefore, ultimately, more, ultimately more secure, provided you have a political agreement to do this. And the really odd thing about America right now is not so much that there is this institutional regulation in place, which, as we discovered when we did the first episode, was there, in fact, to enable borrowing. So originally, in the 19th century, every time the American government issued any kind of debt, it had to go to Congress and ask for permission to issue that particular set of bonds. Mm. And during World War I, that became completely dysfunctional. So during World War I, when they needed to raise for the first time in the 20th century serious amounts of money, they said, no, we'll, we'll create a limit, and then you can borrow up to that. And then if you need to raise it again, you see what I mean, right? Mm. And so the, 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 the truly original thing about America in the current moment is not so much that there's an institutional regulation on debt instruments and that Parliament has something to do with it, because that, that's you know, absolutely standard, but the... You have one, politi one political party in a two-party system that is as utterly cynical and utterly ruthless as the Republican Party is. So it will, you know, rapidly and without fuss increase the debt ceiling for its own presidents and uh, essentially for every Democratic president um, and try and turn this into a hill that they have to die on. And they did this through Obama in 2011, 2013, and this is now the second time round where it's become iffy with, with Biden. And that's, I think, the truly, the truly dangerous element of this. Why it matters is that this debt is held all the way around the world. Mm -hmm. It's held all the way around to the tune of about seven plus trillion dollars. The share is falling over time because America's issued dollars so de de debt so quickly that the, the share has declined quite dramatically from the foreign share being up in the 40s down to something closer to the 2030s now. Uh, of the publicly held debt, but um, that's why it matters globally, because this is this reserve asset that everyone counts on. It's the piggy bank, if you like, that you count on being able to smash. And the last time people had to do this, this isn't some you know deep historic thing. The last time was spring of 2020 during the COVID crisis. There was a very large scale foreign liquidation of treasuries into the American market, which the American market didn't deal with very well. as a huge hiccup. That was the story, really, of the shutdown book that I wrote. Hmm. Um, and so that's the worry that this central kind of l market might stop working and there isn't really an alternative. So for all of the talk about shifting, it's really difficult to see where you'd go. So um, this is where I was surprised to read this quote from a JP Morgan report. Uh, they, mm. they wrote this very extensive report on the debt ceiling crisis and they commented on the role of uh, uh, US debt as that you were just describing. It's all over the world. It's very important to the whole financial system. Uh, this is quote, though, caught me off guard. They say, moreover, though a downgrade, right, a downgrade on the U.S. debt uh, would likely have rating implications, so if there's a default, uh, treasuries remain the highest rated asset in the U.S. and given rising policy and economic uncertainty would likely rally as risk aversion increases. So the way I understood that quote is basically saying that if the U.S., can't service its debt anymore. If it goes into default, the value of the debt and these treasuries, that would actually go up, is what JP Morgan is saying, if I understand that correctly. I mean, what kind of twisted logic is that the US can go into bankruptcy, but then people want even more, US, like they actually want these assets more, even when they're bankrupt and the US can't, can't yeah. service, the, service I mean, it. de Gaulle didn't call it exorbitant privilege for nothing. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this really, this is the exorbitant privilege. It isn't the value of the dollar, the, you know, people buy stuff when they're tourists or living in Germany or whatever. This is the exorbitant privilege, that people buy into your assets at the moment when. And this is, it's important to say, right, America won't comprehensively default on all its treasuries. What the market is right now doing is rapidly sifting through the debts which come due in June, July, August, the ones where there are interest payments that are due, coupon payments, 
And those are the ones which are at risk of being defaulted. And so what you're seeing within the $23, $24 trillion pile that's publicly held is a reshuffling out of those into the ones which don't have payments due until later in the year. And the thought is, of course, that they'll be fine because it's basically an intolerable idea that America, because it wouldn't be a default like Sri Lanka, right? This is an, is an unhelpful analogy, really. It would technically be, but it would be, a, it would be gratuitous. It would be a default of choice. Um, and even that's kind of, we'll talk about some of the options in a second, but even that's kind of, you know, up for grabs, whether or not who's making the choice, because, because those of advanced monetary opinions um, think, in a sense, the, the Biden administration is fully complicit in this. So there's a tactical element to this, which is the Democrats learned from the previous two showdowns in 2011 and 2013 that it doesn't hurt them to take the Republicans to the wire on this. If the Republicans want to you know, fight a war over this, it doesn't do them good to shut down federal government. So the Democrats mm. are playing hardball. Yellen has been notably hawkish on this whole issue and been turning down the idea of prioritizing debt payments as over Social Security, for instance. But... But the, the default will be a technical default. And in, under those circumstances, it's literally true that you look for safety and the thing you run into is the same asset, but the better bits of the same asset. Okay. Because there really isn't anything else in the world. If you're trying to deploy hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars, the entire pile of all other government debt in the world that's available to the public is that amongst advanced countries in China is less than the US Treasury issuance. So it's really, it's like trying to move you know, two whales in a bathtub or something. You know, you can't, there's only so much room that you can, you can make and it's easier to reshuffle within the treasury pile. And this is a, it's not just a speculation. We actually saw this in 2011 and 2013. It's a very, very peculiar phenomenon. Yeah, very strange laws of gravity seem to operate here. But uh, I mean, then, then how, how exactly is this catastrophe supposed to work? If it's yeah. not through a collapse in the, yeah. in, the, in the value of treasuries, if it's not a collapse in the value of U.S. debt, then what is the, the catastrophic scenario here? Well, it's, it's actually, this is quite a fascinating question because if you assume this is the case, then in some senses the default never happens. Right? It's kind of a totally perverse thing. Mm. And so then it may be that this America is another, cannot go bankrupt. This is another one ever. of these... A little bit like Project Fear with Brexit, where like the likes of me were telling everyone that if you do this, the, the world will end the following day. And, you know, to my bitter regret, it didn't. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and that's kind of the problem here as well, that, that they might be able to do this and maybe the world wouldn't end. I mean, if you believe... Crisis the, over. If Done. You, if you, Let's tell if them. You, if, you, <laughs> if you believe the Council of Economic Advisers, the, which are Biden's team... Or Moody's, which are kind of respectable bond rating agencies, insofar as such a thing exists, they they will tell you that a prolonged default is the real worry. So the moment at which this moves from being just a hiccup with some very difficult Republicans not playing ball, because the big worry is McCarthy, even if he gets a deal, cannot rally the right wing of his own party. Right? That's the that's the real that's the real nightmare mm. scenario. That that. Um, if this was protracted over a period of months, then we could really be in for a rough ride. And, and the Council of Economic Advisers takes us to a GDP shock of 8%. And that's, 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 that's great recession. That's 2008 mm. style. We see a huge surge in unemployment. But it's really, this is a very interesting example of where increasingly, you know, we're, I mean, it's an Ulrich Beck kind of, you know, story in the sense that expertise is completely endogenous to our assessment of the world. There is no independent evaluation of this of this, of this freakish event which has never happened before out there which you would thoroughly rely on. All of the estimates are in some sense party pre committed to one or other position in this, in this, in this scenario. Including yours. I yes, guess. yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you can see I'm trying to like, lay off my centrist privilege, I mean, but, you know, mm. prejudices and, you know, digest the experience of Brexit where, where the nightmare never actually arrived, right? And mm. that, that's mm. one of the kind of terrifying lessons of the current moment is, you know, the assumption that, that is in the background even of a lot of left and progressive positions that the natural forces of gravity will somehow prevail and restore common sense, whether it's the falling rate of profit within a Marxist theory or... In this case, sovereign default of the United States leading to the end of the financial world as we know it. Maybe that's, maybe that's not the kind of world that we're actually in. Yeah, I do want to discuss some of the other 
options that might be available yeah. to the U.S. government to sort of solve this contradiction. You know, it has to spend this money. It has to legally. Uh, at the same time, it's not allowed to borrow the money. So what are other ways it can sort of create money? One of the options that I came across in reading about this is pretty sort of commonly... Uh, uh, mint the coin. Mint the coin. We heard it from the audience. Mint yeah, yeah. the coin. Yeah. Even, the, even, even in Germany, they're talking yeah. about minting the coin. I will briefly yeah. try to uh, unpack what that means. Uh, the, so a solution that's discussed among some policymakers in America is that the U.S. Mint, right, which prints the coins in America, the pennies and the quarters and all that actually prints them, that it actually has the power to create a new type of coin, a platinum coin, it's called, and they could give it any denomination at all. And so these policy wonks are saying, why don't we just make a $1 trillion coin? And then we just give that coin to the Federal Reserve, and then they, we can buy more debt with that money, and yeah, presto, changeo, we have made more money out of nothing. So uh, uh, that seemed pretty neat to me, but you tell me, Adam, I mean, uh, what does history suggest about sort of funding the government along uh, these ways? I mean, has that ever been tried before? I mean, what are, what are the upsides and downsides there? Well, I mean, if this were conventional seigniorage and just the printing of money for government purposes, you know, all the way back to the ancient world, but certainly, say, in the early modern period, 30 years war, this, this results in hyperinflation very rapidly, right? Because it's a, it's a, but that isn't the proposal. Um, so the whole idea has a crazy origin, which is some fiscally conservative senator in the late 1990s thought it would be great if the American mint became a genuine source of revenue by printing, by, by not printing, they didn't print money, they, they, this is minting it, literally that's the verb, they mint um, novelty coins. And the more novelty coins you minted, the more seigniorage you'd get. And this would be a neat way of actually propping up. And he was a fiscal conservative, and he thought this would be a good way of actually paying down some of the debt. Hmm. And so there is a specific provision for the minting of platinum coins, because those would be very novel. They, you know, they'd have a dollar on them, or ten dollars, or a hundred dollars, but these would be platinum. To clarify, novelty coin is something that yeah. people buy to like. Yeah, put you see in them in late night like, like, yeah. TV on yeah, the United sure. States. You know, like you know, along something with that you would uh, like. Home exercise Grandpa equipment. would show his exactly. kids. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you, you have this. But it turns out that the law was so framed that there's really no reason why you can't mint a trillion dollar one, right? So in fact, this fiscal conservative legislation opens the door to this act of massive coinage. Now, what you wouldn't do is, as it were, make a million platinum coins and hand them out to American citizens. That would be much more like what we did, more or less, during COVID. And that creates an aggregate demand shock, which is not what the American economy from a conventional point of view needs right now. Mm. So that what you would use the platinum coin for is an operation within the balance sheet of the American public sector. So the idea is not to put the money out there, but to say to the Fed, look, you're holding, the Fed holds, I think, five or six trillion dollars worth of American treasuries. Now, you're sitting on those, and that is debt that we essentially owe to ourselves because the, the Fed is the American government, represents the American taxpayer. The Treasury, the other branch, raises taxes, pays interest on that debt, and ultimately pays the Fed back, and then the public sector is good with itself, right? But what you could also do is make this coin, this trillion dollar coin, and give that to the Fed, if you like, in exchange for, or if you like, as a kind of collateral. Notionally, this is a promise to pay, as those, you know, as currency says, in exchange for a trillion dollars of treasuries that the Fed is holding. Those would then be retired and be considered paid off, and the magic of this is not to do with economics. It just means you get past the silly debt ceiling law because all of a sudden you have a trillion dollars less in debt and you can issue some real debt. Hmm. Right? And that, that would be the way it would work. In other words, it's a, a, not a balance sheet operation in which you take a bit of the treasuries already on the Fed balance sheet, replace them with this singular form of fiat currency. None of it leaks out into the real economy, but you, you, you reduce the debt ceiling relevant debt by whatever amount mm. of use, and that then allows you to issue new debt and repay the ones you've got. Blah, what's not to like? What's not to like? Sounds like a brilliant solution. But uh, the Biden administration has completely ruled it out. They're not doing that. There you go. Because it's crazy talk. Right? You know, it's <laughs> because <laughs> it's... I mean, it's a really good crazy it's, talk. Unfortunately, it it's sense. crazy. But like, unfortunately. But, but I think that is, you know, if they're running for re-election, they maybe yeah. don't want to be the crazies yeah. who did that. I mean, if you go... <laughs> If it, if it had some other name, like, you know, special liquidity provision mechanism. Or, yeah, yeah, that's you know, the problem. It's, it's called in, the trillion you know, dollar we coin. We buried it somewhere. But if we call it the, the, the Tr trillion dollar platinum coin. It sounds coin, like something from an Austin dark, Powers you know, yeah, comedy Brandon or something. Kind of the trillion dollar coin. Like trillion yeah, dollars. trillion dollar. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, yeah. So I think that's the main obstacle. There's also Article 14, but I'm not enough of a constitutional lawyer to like. 
Well, despite all these solutions uh, uh, that are out there, th this whole debt ceiling crisis has raised anxieties, it seems like, about the role of the U.S. dollar in the world. Yeah. I mean, people are talking about how the U.S. Yeah. dollar may no longer be a global reserve currency. This comes up. No one wants the U.S. dollar anymore. But, you know, the dollar seems objectively to be uh, pretty strong at the moment. So, like, are there actually any signs that big investors are losing their faith in the dollar? Or, I mean, if not, why all this anxiety? I think this is a really good question. I mean, I coined this idea of fin fiction or fin fi, fin fic, um, a couple of years ago to describe this because I actually think it is a narrative. In a sense, you look at the world and you go, you know, the world is now multipolar, radically so, especially from the point of view of global GDP or CO2 emissions. American politics is grotesquely dysfunctional. How can it be the case that the dollar still occupies this massively important role in the global economy, something's got to give. And in due course, the tension somehow got to unload, and at some point, then this thing will resolve itself, and then finally, the dollar will fall. And it's almost like an aesthetic logic of the resolution of tension, like a music or a narrative, that leads people to conclude, well, if you stack all those things up, at some point, therefore, this story ends with the dollar falling, doesn't mm. it? And then we have one, you know, we have N of two here, in the modern era, there were two major lead currencies. Before that, there was the pound sterling. And of course, the pound sterling did hang in space for a certain amount of time and then come crashing down. Hmm. So you go look at that history and then you convince yourself that America might be on some sort of similar path or you look for analogs. And that's how we end up with this story, I think. Because there really isn't very much evidence in the data to suggest that this is what's going on. The, the, the number that you'll see most commonly cited is the share of... Um, global reserves held as dollars, which has gone down steadily, not dramatically, gone down steadily from six, you know from <coughs> sixty to seventy percent to ten, fifteen percentage points lower. Um, but the thing that's never added to that statement is the scale of global reserves has enormously increased. So what's happening is that as reserve holders, as the Chinese, the Indians. Uh, the Brazilians, the Russians, the Saudis, the Japanese got into holding very large reserves because the dollar system was so dysfunctional from their point of view. They were self-insuring. They had to put them somewhere, and not all of them could go into dollars. And so those reserves then went into other things. But if you look at the other assets they tend to hold, they tend to have one thing in common, which is that they're all within the global dollar system. So they hold Aussie dollars, or they hold South Korean won. Um, or they hold the Swiss franc. And all of those currencies have in common that they have swap lines with the Federal Reserve. So when push comes to shove, they are tantamount to dollar good. They're exactly the same as dollars, actually. So what you're seeing is a kind of buttressed, expanded system of dollar reach that is more diverse than it was before, because it kind of hardly couldn't be, given that we're holding so much larger mm. volumes of reserves. In the meantime, you're absolutely right. The dollar is very strong right now by historic standards. And there's a whole variety of new things kicking in. The one I singled out in a newsletter recently was the nexus between commodities and the dollar. Previously, there was this relatively benign inverse correlation between the dollar strength and currency prices. So as the dollar rose in value against other currencies, commodity prices tend to fall because so many of the commodities are priced in dollars, and if you were trying to sell commodities to stressed customers, you had to reduce their price if the dollar was more expensive for them to get their hands on the dollars. And so this was this rather benign inverse relationship. As the dollar strengthened, pressure on the world economy was reduced by commodity prices falling. That was when the United States was a major oil importer. Since the fracking revolution, the United States has become a major energy exporter. In fact, the world's biggest energy exporter. That's the, the, the direction it's in. And this has caused the relationship between global commodity prices and the dollar to shift to a positive correlation. So now we're in a world in which as energy prices rise, America's terms of trade get stronger. So the dollar increases in value. So if you are Sri Lanka and you are an oil importer, you're now hit by this double whammy of rising commodity prices, which are even more expensive because you have to get your hands on the dollar. And add to that the third element, which is what else goes with a strong dollar, higher American interest rates, and you've got this triple force, which has been really destabilizing for the emerging market world in this most recent cycle. So this doesn't point to the world uncoupling from the dollar, except per force, because this is a huge crunch. I mean, what we're going to see is whether the world can actually stand a system this tightly linked to the dollar.
That's kind of, I think, the question coming up next, not the American dollar sliding into oblivion, but as the world gets, in a sense, even more hooked on it, mm. can, we, can we cope with that and can they build out the institutions and quite a lot of the innovation you're seeing at the IMF, for instance, to build these low conditionality emergency loan systems you can think of as efforts to patch up the dollar system as in a way it becomes more compulsive, integrates more people in a more powerful way. So this, none of this suggests the system's going away anytime okay. soon. It looks like we're constantly innovating to make it not more robust, but to just kind of keep the wheels on the bus. So there you go. Okay, if you hear anyone saying that the dollar is getting weaker or that its role in the world is uh, weakening, you can just ignore them uh, well, or correct them. It could them. get, just um, be really could, clear, it could get weaker. This is this basic, the dollar value falling might be good for the dollar system. The question we're really saying is how much of a strong dollar can the dollar system stand? The dollar system was built on cheap dollars. Then being widely available, the Fed will always help. There's always mm. going to be liquidity. The interest rates aren't bad. That's what kept the dollar system going. What we're currently actually kind of figuring out is how long it can survive if it's as strong as it is. So the, the market value could be risky from the point of view of its systemic stability. We will shift gears now, actually, to uh, our, our other segment. Uh, the data point there is 533, which is the number of days that the Ampel Regierung, the German government, has been in office. You know, I'm pretty guessing pretty much everyone here is familiar uh, with all the domestic uh, 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 laws that have been passed, the Heizungsgesetz, the various controversies uh, that are ongoing here in Germany. But we wanted to focus uh, on uh, Germany's role in the world. And so, um, yeah, the first question that came to mind is the Zeitenwende. This, uh, this is the um, policy that Olaf Scholz, the chancellor, has announced of uh, Germany's changing relationship to the military, uh, devoting more money to the military as of a year ago, as of the uh, war in Ukraine. So, Adam, has there really been a Zeitenwende? I mean, how do you evaluate this? I mean, in terms of spending, does the German military now have the money it needs? And is a lack of money even really the German military's biggest problem at all? Yeah, this is such a, this is such a tricky question, I think, to get right. In part, because, of course, it's a contentious issue, I think, how far Europe actually needs to spend any more money on defense. I mean, it, if you took Europe collectively, even if you exclude the non-EU members of NATO, so take Turkey out, take the UK out, EU collectively, if it just spent the money in one big batch, would be the third largest military spender in the world after the US and China, and has all the technology and all the spending necessary, over well over 200 billion euros a year, gets you all the credible defense mm. you could conceivably want. For 200 billion a year, you could have the whole works. You know, full spectrum, cyber, you could have aircraft carrier units, you and could have... Yet. And, and yet, yet, exactly. You and hear yet, stories of German you, you uh, have soldiers using broomsticks it's, it's in... It's insane. I mean, in, it's truly... Uh, in, 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 the, in the history exercises. of public spending, it's really hard to understand the Bundeswehr budget. <laughs> it's just because today the Bundeswehr budget's up to 50 billion euros, mm. and I believe they have one semi-functional brigade. One. one. And the brigade is 5,000 troops. 50 for billion. 50 billion. Hmm. Now, okay. that's, that's staggering. Yeah. Like, it's, it's really, I was trying to think about what the analogy, it's like, it's, it's like the, the famous problem of not being able to be a little bit pregnant. It's like, the Amer Germany has a little bit of an army. Like, yeah, but for not, 50 billion dollars, or a little bit of a military. It's, it's, it's astonishing. The problem clearly isn't just money alone, right? Because there's many countries which have highly functional militaries yeah. for much less than Germany has been spending for ages. So there's some I mean, disastrous issue of the way in which, because and it's important, you know, for us of a certain generation, in the late 1980s, the Bundeswehr was generally ranked as the third most capable military in the world. Now, mercifully, it was never actually used to do anything. In the world? Yes, because, because okay. it, it was a 500,000 strong peacetime military, classic German military. It looks, if you look at it as a military historian, just like the army of the Kaiserreich. So it had a peacetime strength of 500,000. It could mobilize to one and a half million within a matter of months. It had Wehrmacht-style tank divisions. This is what it was designed to do, right? It was going to be the Speerspitze. It was going to catch the Soviet, the Warsaw Pact forces as they came through, give the Americans time to scramble. It was the tripwire, not the Americans and the Brits, really, but the, mm. the Bundeswehr was the tripwire. And 
everyone rated that as a competent, this is where the leopard and all these tanks come from, is that generation of German military spending. Something after that happens in which German politics doesn't have the courage of its convictions to go the whole Dutch route and say, look, we just don't need a military anymore, hmm. but instead just sort of sucked funding out of a structure that remained baggy, dysfunctional. You've got 200,000 men and women, broadly speaking, still in uniform, but many of them don't even have complete uniforms. <laughs> They're in barracks, <laughs> which are a disgrace, hmm. and you're still managing to spend 30 billion euros. Yeah. At, 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 the, at, the, at the Nadia, 34 billion, right? Before hmm. Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen, who will go down in history as quite a significant figure in many, you know, quite ambiguous, but quite a significant player, tipped it in a different direction. And since then, the German budget has gone up to 58 billion this year, right? So 50 from the regular budget plus eight from the Sonderfond, which is significant spending, but apparently still not enough to actually produce any kind of capable military. So there is, there is a money problem here, but there is also a classic problem of badly organized downsizing. Hmm. Um, because the British and French spending on the military is a little less, a little more than the German, but they get spectacularly more bang for the buck, right? They actually have competent, deployable units at multiple brigade strength. And so there's a really interesting set of German questions here about kind of reform style that is that's significant. And so that makes you pessimistic about the idea of adding a couple of 10 billion euros a year to this just deeply dysfunctional organization. Um, so that's, yeah. that's kind of my worry about even, you know, it's, I'm tempted to say the Germans just should give their money to other people who actually want to do soldiers, I mean, like maybe the Poles, and that would be yeah. a more, that would be a more, Mer because there was a proposal, Mer yeah. right, to bring foreigners into the Bundeswehr. It might actually be better to just, to just hmm. you know, make the fiscal effort by all means, but actually leave it to a society. Because I do think it's a very open question as to whether or not in Germany right now you could recruit enough yeah, people I, who are really interesting in being. You know, um, I mean, a lot of this gets caught up in terms of the numbers and, yeah. and, and various things, but you're describing a military that cannot, probably not defend the country. I mean, at all. No, absolutely right? okay. Okay. okay, good, good, just to know. Uh, there you go. So as well. I mean, we should you know, all the, everyone uh, here should def get prepared to defend themselves. I mean, I t I t is I really I, the, the I, point. I teach a course in the history of German of, of Germany through the, qu the question of war and peace, all the way back to the early modern period, and the the, de the, de the declaration by the General Inspector of the Bundeswehr in the, in 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 in, uh, in February, was it February or early March of, of 2022, will go down in history as you know, what the Germans call Offenbarungseid. I mean, it is unbelievable that a society of this scale should literally have its chief soldier say, you know, <laughs> we just really don't have anything. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Not much to contribute on this issue <laughs> of soldiering business, right? Mm. And I mean, you have to go back to, mm. you have to go back to places like Württemberg in the 18th century that opted out of militarism to this extent. You know, they, they, there were choices made by small German states in the 18th century, not surprisingly faced with Louis XIV on your boundaries, where you just kind of think, well, you know, we're not <laughs> in this game. You know, Prussia was unusual in, 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 in super militarizing. So there are, in German history, there are choices, but it's pretty difficult to think of anything quite analogous to the last couple of decades. It's very, it's very anomalous in terms of German history generally. Okay, yeah. yeah, I did not know we would be going to 18th century Württemberg, but um, uh, uh, I do want to shift now to the finance ministry. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you famously wrote an article um, in Die Zeit warning about the appointment of Christian Lindner mm. uh, as finance minister, specifically focused on the international aspects of his job. So 533 days in, uh, what do you make of, uh, of your warnings? Have they, have they panned out? What do you, what do you think? Well, yeah, we got quite a lot of shit for doing that, actually. It was, it was uh, not entirely popular with my German colleagues. Mm. It, was, it was very, it was very, um, nicht zum Volkskörper zugehörig was a phrase that was used. Wie trauen Sie sich ein solches Urteil zu? Wow, yeah. It was quite, not so, not belonging to the body politic of Germany. How dare you make a judgment like this? Mm. Uh, it was quite, it was quite, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, quite, quite heavy. Um, I, no, I don't think we have any reason to regress it, right? We were clearly right. <laughs> there we go. Uh, no, and, no. and uh, we were right. Take we that, were, we were German right folks. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Hey, no, no, no. no that's not my point. Take that. no, my, I take this to be unusual reaction because I know perfectly well the intervention was in fact, oh, I won't go into the details. But anyway, there's an internal politics to that intervention, which is not external to Germany, obviously, right? published in Die Zeit for crying out loud. 
just start there, right? So it's not like Joe and I can just knock <laughs> yeah. on, well, Joe maybe, but not me anyway, can just say, hey, we'd like to give our opinions about something, sure. right? Detail has been shut down since now. No, <laughs> they, were, so, they were now punished. So, <laughs> no, but the point that's worth making here is our argument was never personal, right? It's a, it was structural. It's just, and it, it comes back from thinking hard about the Eurozone crisis. If you think about the way in which the German government reacted at different phases to Europe's problems, 2008, where you had the Große Koalition, you had a much wider open view of how they were going to deal with the, with the, uh, with the uh, Greek problem. In, in, um, in 2020, with Schultz as finance minister and Merkel in the chancellery, again, we had a very different reaction. So what is the difference here? What we're asking really is an analytical question. And what we're saying is that German coalition politics matters. And it matters not just within Germany. It matters within the bigger picture of European politics. Because if you have a complex German coalition with the liberals as ballast, if you like, or a flywheel, or as a wild card within the politics of the coalition, you're in trouble because they're looking for places, they're looking for ways to, pro to profile themselves. In the Angela Merkel coalition, if you like, there was Merkel's modernizing project for the CDU, there was the FDP, and then you had Schäuble, who was trying to fly the flag for the conservative wing, if you like, of the CDU, trying to still close the ranks against the far right, which was coming with the AFD, which was an anti anti-Draghi, anti-Euro politics first, right? And that's really bad for Europe when that happens because you don't have solid majorities within Germany. That government of Merkel was on wafer-thin majorities a lot of the time. She had to rely on the SPD votes in the Bundestag for a lot of the crisis fighting on Greece. And this is really bad news. And furthermore, the people in Washington know it and remember it really well. If you speak seriously to you know, people currently in the Biden administration who are veterans of the Treasury in the Obama period, when they looked at the coalition government, that was the first thing they said they were saying to folks like us in, in, Washington, in, in, in New York. It's like, oh, Jesus, is this as bad as this looks? Mm. But so that was, our, that was our point, is that there is here, from an international relations point of view, a really interesting coupling between the microdynamics, you might say, of German national politics and the functionality of Germany at a global level. And our point was not really FDP, because I quite like this coalition, but can they, for Christ's sake, not take a less exposed job in which these constraints don't operate on them with the, sh with the mechanical force with which they're operating on them right now? And, but no, they wanted this job and they, and, they, and they went for it. So what we haven't seen so far, and this is the good news, is the explosion over Europe, right? But that's not to do with German politics, that's to do with the general Konjunkturlager, and the fact that we've been preoccupied with things other than the Stability and Growth Pact. But Lindner's position, I mean, it was, it was really as though a chatbot had written, like, a, you know, Lindner's piece in the FT. If we'd actually asked AI to produce a Lindner response to our piece in April 2022, 2023, it would have said, you know, the 60% 60, 60 Maastricht and 3% Maastricht rules are untouchable. And that's mm. literally what he says in the... In the, and on that basis, this comes back to this fundamental issue of realism. We can't do politics in Europe, right? Because Italy's debt level is 140% of GDP. So between mm. 60 and 140, there's just too big a gap. And mm. this is con re you know, conservatism's deep political problem right now, is how do you manage a realistic conservative politics faced with a world of what I call polycrisis. Like, it's, it's a really quite deep problem. I don't envy them. They need to go to a Bis Bismarckian place, right? Everything has to change so that everything stays the same. This is why Draghi and people like that are interesting, is that they, they're deeply conservative people, deep really, but they are willing to put it all in the food blender, if necessary, and they're confident that out the other end they can kind of get a mix which they can work with, and this dogged sticking with these rules is not going to get you there. That is crisis provoking, enhancing, dynamizing rather than calming, which is what they naively imagine it to be. Well, I don't even know, actually. I think they're actually just playing politics. It's just tactics. I mean, to shift to another part of Europe, um, uh, specifically Ukraine, uh, obviously that is actually going to be the subject of your appearance tonight at Maybrit Ilna, so there's a bit of a preview maybe. Um, uh, I mean, I wonder what kind of challenge does the reconstruction of Ukraine represent? And I mean, should Germany just be preparing the public for that big challenge already. We don't really talk much about reconstruction in Ukraine, but yeah, what, what's looming there? I mean, I, I've, 
would feel it was quite irresponsible to spend too much time harping on that right now. I mean, you can understand why Kiev is like mobilizing everyone and just ramping up the budget for the reconstruction every single meeting they hold. And, you know, we're going to we're at 500, 600 billion already. They're going to keep on pushing. Obviously, they must. Right. Um, and the damage, of course, is horrendous. And what they're going to do is double down on that with a kind of build back better agenda. So like, right now, I think they quadruple the estimates of the damage the Russians have inflicted to arrive at the number they want. Which, mm. You know, it's, it's good politics. They've they got to strike when the iron is hot. It's amazing. You know, as a political performance alone, you really have to appreciate what they're, what they're pulling off. But we're not. I mean, how on earth can we be talking about this? I mean, this war is this is the fundamental challenge i think almost cognitively and morally politically of the current moment it's like it's been a very long time since we were in a situation in which the outcome of a war a big war between big players with existential stakes is as uncertain as this i mean really a long time i mean i think iran iraq is like the last time in the 80s is really the last moment and you wouldn't think of them as central to the global system though they were very important as russia is but I mean, in World War II, for most of the last two or three years, it was just a grind. The outcome was very clear. In the Yugoslav civil wars, I guess you could say, but then small fry by comparison, ultimately, not in terms of casualties and, and, and cruelty, but in terms of global significance. It's, we've not hung in the balance like this before with, with all the off-ramps looking bad for all sides. So, I mean, you know, I, to me, talking about, you know, a, mm. a wonderful $600 billion package for Ukrainian reconstruction is like escapism. It's mm. escapism. Um, if you're going to go that way, the way to do it is to avoid at all costs, be French, to avoid at all costs any talk of costs, right? This isn't about bills. This is a gigantic opportunity for infrastructure investment. You know, you, Ukraine comes in with essentially a next-gen EU scaled stimulus program for all of the green infrastructure businesses of Germany, Austria, Italy. It's, it's the stimulus program. And because the money will be ours, it'll sweep through. It's not going to stay in Ukraine. I mean, it'll create jobs in Ukraine, but it'll flush back out. And they already, we talked about this on one of the shows, they're assembling these coalitions region by region. You can kind of partner up with the Ukrainian mm. region. And they're divvying up the reconstruction jobs amongst the Hochbau, Tiefbau, you know, the German engineering companies. It's going to be great. There and I was, at a, I was at a spring meeting um, uh, thing organized by a bank in, in D.C. And the American lobbyists were just gung-ho about it. They love it. Like, it's mm. going to be huge business for Halliburton and all these kind of people. But, but we've got to get there. Yeah. Right? And that's where this gets, this gets just impossible. I mean, it sounds like the implication about. of what you're saying is we should be talking more about military spending. I mean, spending and giving... Well, whatever you, and, whatever yeah, you think. Yeah. I mean, this is a zone that, you know, that or negotiation, yeah. right? That's yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 all of the options are bad. Mm. Um, obviously, uh, uh, a couple more international topics before we turn to the uh, question and answer session here. But um, uh, in terms of relations with China... The G7 now has settled on de-risking yeah. this term as a goal when it comes to economic relations with China. But, you know, the perspectives between the United States and Germany seem pretty different when, yeah, it comes to the economic relationship with China. I mean, can Germany plausibly wind down its dependencies on China in the way that the United States seems to be trying to? And is there a clear logic for Germany to try to kind of wind down its relationship mm -hmm. with China? Yeah, another Ursula von der Leyen phrase. Mm. De-risking is her idea, right? Rather uh, than decoupling. Decoupling, yeah, yeah. And, and it's really a very unusual in the history of transatlantic rhetorical transfer. It's incredibly unusual for a European term to become, you know, the phrase du jour in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and they all, they all really have globbed onto it. That's the new thing since the G7. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's a considerable victory for the European agenda at that level. And the pullback, we, I did a piece for you about Yellen's you know, mm. efforts to pull back out of the confrontational position. I think DC freaked itself out a little bit earlier. You, uh, no doubt you, you, the foreign policy got wind of this, but the, the free Zacharias of this world, the Max Boots, um, Ed Luce and the FT, folks like myself, one tier down, that are in the kind of media loop of the White House were, you know, as a historian who's taught a lot about 1914 anyway, it was, it was, it was a pretty scary moment because you could feel the vibes. Mm. And there was this weird sense that, oh shit, we really are actually talking about war now. I mean, are we for real? I mean, for, for, no, for it, real, it's remarkable. Real? It seems that the one thing that was, everyone agreed on yeah. was 
some sort of hostility yeah. towards China. It was, it's absolutely astonishing. So now there's been this like effort to pull back, and I don't really know how coherent it is. And you're absolutely right. For the US, in a sense, for individual US corporate players, it's a huge challenge in Apple, it's Apple, 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 Apple. Right? Apple still is by far the most valuable company in the world. If Apple goes down, the New York Stock Exchange is a different place. I mean, or whatever it is, NASDAQ, wherever it's listed, right? It's mm. a $2 trillion company. It is the prize in the American tech scene, the one durable anchor. It has no business plan other than China. Like the stories about India are really window dressing. Um, it is hugely dependent on China. I mean, it's not really very rapidly uncoupling itself. For manufacturing. For manufacturing, yeah, yeah. But not and, necessarily but also, as a market. No, no, also for markets. Like, oh. it, you know, Apple makes in China to sell in at China, which is what all of the big players do, right? Um, Germany is a completely different kettle of fish. The Economist had a really good graphic on this. Um, if you add up manufacturing exports, service exports, and the earnings of German affiliates in China... So the kind of a rough estimate of the positive flow that you get from entanglement with China is 10% of German GDP. That's, that's serious money. 10% of German GDP is a big number. That's a different order of magnitude than Russia. For the US, it's only 4%. Hmm. And I think that really points to why this... And, you know, in the German corporate hierarchy, they're very explicit about it. Unlike Apple, which is quite shy... VW, Daimler, BMW are all completely up front and saying there is no future for us without China. They say it all the time. You mm. know, imagining a world without China. The, the thing that's going to shift, and this is the thing to really watch, is this techie industrial story about the fact that they are losing market share in China so rapidly, especially the motor vehicle companies, the German motor vehicle companies. But in a sense, the decoupling may happen from the Chinese side mm. by simply the force of of markets and what we're really talking about is the historic failure of the european car producers but also the japanese and the south koreans to a degree to shift quickly enough from the prius turbo diesel kind of spectrum to full ev and that's where the chinese are dominating and that is going to end the commercial entanglement of one of the really important sectors quite quickly perhaps entirely without politics in a direct sense of course the chinese subsidize their ev development but it's going to be the market that drives this because Chinese consumers want different things from their cars than European producers, it turns out. They're not principally, you know, dominated by, you know, kind of autobahn speed and they're super into the digital features of the cars, the, the way in which they interface with their electronics and quite bought in on EV. And so there's a sort of, that's another scenario I don't think we fully computed Mm. which is that the Chinese market might in the end just simply turn against Western producers, which would end the entanglement problem as but, an industrial crisis of a different type. But a bigger problem for Germany than Huge the United States. Huge problem for Germany. Yeah, much bigger problem for Germany. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, um, uh, but, but between, the, yeah, with the United States and, the, and, and, and China as these two big players, I wonder how this also applies uh, on climate policy. Um, I mean... Germany obviously focuses a lot on climate policy. It's the subject of a lot of domestic politics right now. But yeah, how much does Germany really matter for global climate policy? I mean, if the mm. global economy and by extension, you know, climate developments are increasingly structured by U.S. and China. Um, yeah. What is Germany's role? I mean, is it a moral example for others to follow? Is that really its sort of special role here? Or is that even really a category yeah. in international politics? Yeah. I don't think we should put the China and the US in the same pot. I mean, one of the pieces I'm most pleased I did for you is the one which immediately addressed Xi Jinping's announcement in September 2020 that China was going to achieve net zero by 2060. That is a world historic, absolutely world historic turning point. Um, it's a world historic turning point because China's responsible by itself for almost 28% of global CO2 emissions. 28%. That's the same as all of the rich countries in the world put together and on a hugely ascending curve. Um, so th that means that really, you know, if you have just one sort of approximation, like one call to make, the, the climate politics of the world are decided by that, by that regime. China's problem, of course, is that it's only 28%. So it's the collective action problem that we always imagined in the West that we had is now theirs in spades, because they need everyone else to move along with them. Um, this is reflected also in, in renewable energy spending. Um, Last year, Bloomberg New Energy for, uh, Foundation counted $1.1 trillion for the first time in, new energy in, in, in renewable energy investment. Half of that is in China. Half of it. $180 billion in Europe, $110, $20 in the US. Not even in the same ballpark. If you go upstream, 
to investments in the factories which produce the stuff that are going to drive the renewable energy revolution. China's share of global spending last year was 90%. In the last five years, it's never been less than 70%. The climate change industrial policy thing is China's. They are also in the crosshairs of the crisis because their ecological balance is so fine. We shouldn't put America, we shouldn't dignify America's response by putting it in the same category. Right? The Inflation Reduction Act is an order of magnitude smaller than what the Chinese are doing. But your question about Europe, I think, is well taken and what is Germany's role? I mean, Germany, fan I, mean, I was going to say fantasizes, fancies hmm. itself as a climate leader. And obviously, the Green Party historically um, is, as it were, a leader of global ecological politics, not just German eco ecological politics. But if you look at the track record, if you look at CO2 emissions, if you look at the industrial structure, if you look at the actions of this government, which is you know, our best hope, I think, of a kind of progressive green government in Europe right now, if you look at public opinion polling, the Spiegel had a really sobering set of data earlier this year, it's you know a very complex, as you'd expect in German politics, right? German politics doesn't have a common denominator all the way back to the Thirty Years' War, and the nature of German politics is its plurality. And so, if you look on climate, the Spiegel data, and you know there's different versions of this as always, the Spiegel data had one third of Germans considering climate particularly relevant for them, uh, up against other issues, social policy, the economy. But that's the really relevant question because everyone will say, "I'm in favour of Klimaschutz," like you know, "I'm in favour of apple pie and motherhood," like you can't be against <laughs> klima shots. I want a klima gefährdung is my thing. In America. Like, like, obviously, yeah, you know, I, obviously I, like, I really hate to damage the environment. Mm. Like, that's my, but, but one third said it was relevant. Half said it was not relevant. Not less, not relevant for them. And then you had 17% in between and decided. And I think German politics quite accurately reflects that you know, if you look across the parties, 90% of green voters say it's crucial for them. But then you go to the right side of the spectrum in the CDU, it's a clear minority. When you get to the AFD, it's like a tiny minority. They're an anti-climate party, right? So, so the, the in even before you get into the industrial structure, um, which is both why Germany has a problem and why it could matter, the, 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 again, the, with the, the setting aside ethics and political incentive, you know, and, and morality, it's hard to be a consistent climate politician in Germany because you're up against some very powerful interests. If you can flip them, like the motor vehicle industry, then all of a sudden Germany actually does become a key part of the puzzle because Germany is a massively outsized player in that particular industry, potentially in, in electrical engineering as well. And then it has long experience in solar and wind. It's no longer mm. the leader in either. Um, but that will be its role, quite modest, but a big player within the EU. And the EU then again becomes a major factor because like it will lump it, and you know, the EU is the only place in the world which currently has a carbon pricing system that actually bites. Where we are right now, it makes a difference. Now, you don't, you, you, I understand the politics of carbon pricing. It's not everyone's cup of tea. It's clearly a neoliberal wet dream from the late 1990s. The crazy thing is the Europeans went with it and actually did it. And like no one else, everyone else looked at this and said, this is totally toxic. We're not going to do this. The Americans, first of all. But Europe, Europe's done it. But, and, and now, actually, it's beginning to bite in interesting and important ways. And, and driving on that has spillover effects with CBAM carbon border adjustment. It gets complicated. But we, we don't have time to mess around, right? This is a, this is a, this is a carbon reduction tool that, that works. Um, and so we should keep on driving it and forcing it. You end up sounding like the FTP, um, <laughs> who like this too. And that's not enough, right? Because we need the other elements of the package. We need investment, we need incentives, we need the social... You know, we need to deal with the hard cases that this kind of pricing generates. And then we end up in the question of the, you know, the, the boilers and the mm. and all of that. And uh, we see how toxic it gets. Sounded like a peace offering to Christian Lindner, but yeah. revoked there at the last second. Well, the, um, the carbon pricing, I'm not, you know, friends on the left just, just don't want to have anything to do with it. And you, you can see why. But I think the, the gilets jaune bo boogie figure should be... You know, well, that's obviously just that scaremongering. In general, I think Germans might be surprised to hear they are not the leaders on, on this issue that they that 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 they might think, you know, in, in global terms. There are other there are, though, other uh, uh, big countries, China, United States making investments now. So let me I mean, like the thing that I do think in the ample coalition 
it could. I was going to write. You and I discussed us writing. We were going to do. A, you, I think you ended the one, but like mm. we were going to do one of those kind of um, crush pieces on Harbeck early on in the administration, like you know. And um, yeah, that and uh, and the thing that I like about their vision is that they had this sense of urgency. They do have this sense of urgency, right? Because that's really the daunting aspect of the climate challenge. Is you have to do a. 7% reduction per annum for the next 30 years in a country like Germany to get to net zero by 2050. 7% per annum. That is 2020 levels of reduction every single year for 30 years. That means you have to do a quarterly, a quartals program. You actually have to do this like you're running a business and you have to achieve a 1.5% reduction every quarter, every three months. And mm -hmm. that... That's a huge challenge for democratic politics, right? Because, because it's relentless and confusing you have to have so many damn programs and they have to keep coming and they never stop. And, and they are, I think, the first political group to effectively articulate that as the mission of the ministry because they actually did have a Frühjahrs program, a Sommers program, a Herbst program. That was their plan before Putin's war mm. derailed everything. And that, I think, is, again, it's a very important moment in the history of global climate politics that we suddenly began to realize the temporal challenge, right? Mm. The, the fact that this changes the nature of the democratic, economic, industrial climate policy game. So we've covered a lot of topics here, uh, but now we want to shift uh, to the audience. I'm sure there are questions. We'll take questions on any topic at all. Uh, so uh, don't hold back. Uh, let it rip. And, uh, yeah, we'll take as many as... Okay, sounds good to me. Yeah, great. Uh, we got somebody in the middle there. I and see somebody yep. at the back. The person in the middle with bushy hair, I think. Yes, I see a hand right over there. Stand up. And, uh, <laughs> there, there might be other bushy hair like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. uh, my name's Wyatt Constantine. I'm a PhD candidate down in Leipzig. I made the pilgrimage up to Berlin to see you. So. Oh, thank you. Very much. <laughs> All right. I'm a little embarrassed to say I kept crashed on my bedside for quite a long time. It was really like a. Was it a couple's thing? These are, these are, my, these are my weird. My girlfriend like, does not want to hear any more about you. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> she rolled my eyes when I, when I told her. I was <laughs> My, my question had to do with a comment you made at a podcast at the end of last year, and that had to do, I work on a research project in Leipzig concerned with tertiary unemployment amongst African graduates. And you made this very salient, interesting point, I think, about not only Africa increasingly in the 21st century being a concentration of human misery, which I think is very grim, but also very, very fair, but also there's been sort of one game in town when it comes to development in this continent, and I feel like there's a critical lack of thought and theory and discussion about how the demographic base of human growth in the 21st century is going to be employed, what employment and labor and sort of alternatives to like gutting the public sector and hoping mm. private money comes in yeah. looks like. And I would be very curious to hear what your thoughts are about that. I'll just try to briefly uh, sum up the question. Um, it is about... Uh, Africa and its future growth and potential development models for Africa that 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 take it seriously um, Yeah, aside from the kind of cliches that one often hears about Africa um, Yeah, sorry. I, I feel I feel particularly bad. I have to rush off afterwards I can't hang mm. out and talk more and my <laughs> mind. I was thinking we organize a breakfast meeting on the fly, but um, uh, Same place so same, uh, place, same <laughs> place at 9 a.m. Tomorrow um, um, yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I, I really appreciate your question because I do think um, Africa as challenge, opportunity, just reality, um, you know, challenge, opportunity immediately kind of problematizes this vast continent with this incredible, you know, wealth of, of people and we're kind of thinking about them as an issue. Uh, but is is a reality to really is really a reality to focus on as hard as we can and as capaciously as we can and the issue that you raise which i take to be the issue really of the linkage between education and employment is is absolutely is absolutely pivotal the the you know from an economic point of view as much as one might want to just sort of gamble on um as you might want to just gamble on human potential and entrepreneurship and and just kind of hope for the best 
you, it's very difficult. We don't have a, we don't have any growth experience or growth model which suggests you can do this without capital, um, and that's the problem. I mean, the ratios of capital to labor across mm. the entire African continent are just so low and have gone down in per capita terms as far as we're able to measure them. And th this is the central problem of development policy. As you say, you know, there's been essentially one formula. Well, there's been two. There's been one formula from the West since the 2000s, which is some sort of blended finance model. The Germans have been very, very, you know, in, uh, forward on this. The KfW, the Germany's public bank, everyone's favorite public bank in the world is actually, as somebody like Daniela Gabel will teach you, an, a total progenitor of a neoliberal public-private blended finance model in which a small amount of public money is used to leverage up private mobilization. It's the German social market economy as a global development formula, which then went global with the World Bank. And, you know, as glossy and as sort of neatly architected at its looks, as it looks, and for all, you know, its ambiguous distributional politics, its main problem, as far as I'm concerned, is it just hasn't delivered. It just hasn't delivered the scale of funding that we would need. I mean, Daniela and the likes of the critical macrofinance people I feel so close to in many ways focus so much on the politics of the structure that, to my mind, they miss the central issue, which is just simply, is it generating the funding flow? And if it were, I would find this a really difficult choice. You know, you would then have to trade off a bad political economy against a large fl flow of funds, which is more, say, the Chinese situation, where we have real growth and an oppressive and authoritarian regime. That's a hard trade off. This one isn't hard because, you know, it's both kind of bad political economy and it hasn't generated growth, which, which or certainly not on the scale that's necessary. It's not right to say it hasn't generated growth because parts of the African continent have seen considerable growth, but not on the scale. And so that's where the Chinese enter the story, but the tragedy of the Chinese story is in a sense that it stopped. Right? So from 2019 onwards, we think that the, the net capital flow from China to the developing world is negative. They're actually pulling back. So then really what we're looking at, and I can't recommend highly enough the Phenomenal World's polycrisis blog uh, with uh, Kate McKenzie and Tim Sahay, and they did a great piece a couple of weeks ago on the... Um, on the global austerity crunch, which is being unleashed by a funding crisis. And so this is really in the background, I think, of the current world. And, and again, it's a matter of time because the African population surge is something that also needs to be addressed on a quarterly basis. We need to be asking every single year how far and how close are we to the 500 to $600 billion every single year that needs to be going mm. in in terms of infrastructure investment. And the answer is we're one-tenth of the way there you know, in a good year one-tenth of the way. And you can, you know, I've confronted, I've had the chance to confront people of goodwill and great intelligence in the White House with this sort of question, and they just don't have an answer. It's really, it's really jaw-dropping, vertiginous. They totally see the arithmetic. They totally know the scale of the problem. They know their architecture looks pretty and they like it and it's conforming to their political economic notions and they also know it doesn't deliver and they know it doesn't deliver by almost an order of magnitude, a factor of 10. It's, it's quite... And then you look at them and go, so... Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and this doesn't resolve. That's the point I'm making, right? You, it never... You never... It just hang. Well, he's the PhD student. Maybe he has answers. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean, know. Like, <laughs> kudos <laughs> to you. Um... Are there any other questions in the audience? Uh, yes, you in the back in the white T-shirt there. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I see. Oh, I I was pointing I was pointing to to, to the person in the back uh, one one row behind. But you can go next, please. Uh, yes. Hi there. My name is Michael. Uh, Wait, I want to clarify this. You, you're from SAIS, which is a university in the United States. You fly from America here? We have a satellite campus in Italy. Okay, from Italy. Still, okay. that beats Leipzig. Okay, Wait, we gotta, we, we gotta, Wait, can we gotta. Beat Italy? Uh, <laughs> we gotta do something tomorrow morning or later on tonight. I feel this is terrible. Um, yeah, you're, you're the one going uh, to my Brit Illness. Yeah, I know. It's not, like it's not. It's, it really, <laughs> she personally emailed me. <laughs> exactly. I, 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 I'll tell you, I wrote several emails saying, I'm not coming I, on your show. I can't do it to her showrunner. And then the lady herself <laughs> personally emails me. Yeah. And I just, they I don't have it guns. in me Ilner to herself. just say, I'm sorry, most famous woman of, you know, late night German television. I can't do your show. I just, I can't do that. 
But we should uh, I, we organize something. Uh, well, we can. <laughs> <laughs> we should. Do, I get, or we all stay. You do why your thing. We, you come we, back here. Well, maybe that'll yeah, yeah, work. Okay, that I don't know. No, um, seriously, that might be an idea. Um, anyway, I don't know. We, we can, we we'll can be in touch. We'll, we'll exactly yeah. follow yeah. ones and twos on yeah. Twitter. I don't know. Maybe we'll announce something. Um, anyway, what's your question? But yeah, what was the question? <laughs> I, I think I mean, maybe I should summarize the question oh, sorry, very briefly. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, um, the question is about the Ameri Americans who have somewhat become blasé about the debt ceiling mm. crisis and, and citing all the many other times this crisis have come up and been averted. And so, uh, yeah, have Americans sort of, do they have some kind of knowledge about the debt ceiling crisis in the way they've gotten used to it? Or are they just being naive? I think this is a really interesting question, which which as a European who moved to the US, I had to get used to this. Because if you take the Amtrak up and down the East Coast Corridor as a European, you have this experience over and over again. Like, this isn't possible. It can't actually be like this. How on earth can so much of it look like the set of The Wire? How can it be this desolate and destroyed? This isn't, this, this mm. must end soon. Like, this cannot, this is what empires look like when they fail and fall. And surely the clock is running out on this country. And then you realize, no, that's just actually the churn of American capitalism. It is utterly ruthless. It just burns through places and people, marches on. It has the highest growth rate of the advanced economic world. Yeah. It just powers through this. It's just really messy. It doesn't bother kind of covering up its bodies, right? It just, it just chunders on through. And, and you have to get used to that. So I think there's an element of this in this coverage of this crisis, which in the US has now acquired a degree of, we've been here before, we've done it before, we've survived the last time, hell, JP Morgan tells mm. us the dollar will actually strengthen and yields will come down. Like, we can do this. And the rest of the world, when it does pay attention, looks at this and says, well, if we did this, it would be the end of the world. Like, this can't work. How and this takes me back to that argument I was having about financial fiction with this tension that feels as though it must resolve itself. And in fact, if you live in the US, you sort of experience this as this somewhat dull kind of, you know, kind mm. of medium high. You never really, you kind of, you run it through. I'm, I'm offering a, a kind of, a, it's a rather, rather uh, anecdotal cultural read. I think it's also simply true that it's also simply true that key operators in the US system, like JP Morgan, I mean, that note that we read out hmm. was not intended for public consumption. It got out into public consumption because FT Alphaville picked it up. FT Alphaville then stuck it out on Twitter, and then you people like you and me start talking about it in front of audiences like this. But JP Morgan's take was really for an inside group of investors to whom they were saying, look, stick with us, because JP Morgan isn't mm. just any old player in the US Treasury market. They are the US Treasury market on the private side. And we're going to handle this, and it's going to be OK. And if you're on the inside of this, don't bet against the Treasury. I mean, what they're really saying to their investors is, if you do the obvious thing and short the Treasury, you'll regret it. It's going up in price, not down. Mm. Buy in, don't short. And, and so there's a... A kind of within that loop, <coughs> which is very different from maybe your mother or your grandmother or your dad or your uncle or your, you know, your little sibling or whatever, who is paying a different kind of attention to this problem. Within that inside group, there is a kind of collective decision to hold the system together, to bid into it rather than to bid out of it at this critical moment. And that is highly functional in stabilizing the system. Hmm. So it's a... And we saw this at various times in the Eurozone crisis. It's a thesis that goes all the way back to somebody like Barry Eichengreen thinking about the gold standard. If you do have that kind of commitment on the part of a relatively closed elite to buying into the system as it faces challenges, it has a hugely stabilizing 
quality. But that's not necessarily something most Americans are drawing on that knowledge. But I mean, in some ways, yeah, it, 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 that could be happening in parallel to just Americans just, just being sort of day. just being at yeah. this point. So where, where yeah. yeah, again, people have said the sky is falling, the sky is falling so many times over so many years. It's I do think that that anecdotally is true. The first time this came up in the Obama administration, I feel like there was much more palpable anxiety. But I feel like by virtue of it's just being repeated, people have gotten a bit But there's uh, also, uh, I mean, uh, used the, to it. the question is whether at some point we reach tipping point, what other, what yeah. else it interferes with. Um, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that I share the blase assessment. Um, what I guess I'm saying is that um, this, like so many other of the crises that we face, has this quality that we feel as though we're inching towards a tipping point. And it seems almost implausible that we aren't there yet, but I think we have to reckon with the countervailing forces, which are very substantial. Mm. So it's a little bit like the COVID drama, where we never really got to the apocalypse. We flattened the curve. In a sense, there's a story here about panic curve flattening. Mm. There you go. Um, Let's take a few together, because yes, I see please. the clock on the right I hand see. side. Yes, um, yes then, please. Oh my um, let's take a few questions. Uh, the fir yeah, please. The first person who I mistakenly uh, stood up previously, and then, uh, yeah, there, and then here, and then here. That's four questions I see here. So please, go ahead. Hi, my name is Josh. Um, for my sins, I used to work for the British Labour Party, so I was really interested to hear you point about Harlech. And I've been living here, living here for a while. I did a bit of stuff with the SPD in the last uh -huh. federal election. And by chance, I happened to go to a Die Kronen, uh, local meeting recently. I was really struck between the different three, the culture, yes. the internal cultural differences. I mean, obviously the UK Labour Party is not going to win any prizes for having a good internal culture. <laughs> um, but I suppose the question is more about how do you think in different European countries the internal cultures of different political parties play out? I think mm -hmm. that's an interesting thing that is your question. It is, yeah. And for the yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the other question, I'm going to collect a few here. I know there was one okay. there, yeah. please. Uh, I, I mean, in the, I'm sorry, it's so it's hard for me to see, but yes, I think that person there who just raised their hand, that, yes, please. Um, yeah, so, question to Adam. Uh, Stefan Schulz, a German sociologist and podcaster, said on his podcast, I guess half ironically, or he proclaimed that uh, Christian Lindner um, it's the most dangerous uh, man in Europe. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I was uh, wondering um, if you could comment and maybe offer a kind of a real time uh, historic uh, account or place him as a historical figure, uh, especially in regards to the climate crisis. Good, okay, thank you. And so I'll push it here on the edge. Yes, I think you uh, towards the, yeah. So uh, I'm Marcel Tash, I teach history and political science here in Berlin. Uh, you said in the 90s that you were a, a sort of unification skeptic. Mm. So here we are 35 years later. Mm. My question is, we spent trillions of euros. Has the unification mm. project been mm. successful here? Mm. Mm. And here in the front of someone, yes. Um, so this may be a selfish, selfish question, but um, myself, just having finished the Abitur, so mm. just graduated, and desperately wanting to invoke change, and mm. being interested in economics, mm. I wonder what is your judgment on studying economics, because as far as I can judge, and as far as I heard, the economics degree, at least in Germany, seems so far detached from actually reality, and uh, <laughs> well, what, what goes on in the world is just another yeah, yeah. world from what is mm. ta taught, at least mm. uh, in The Bachelor. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to try to sum up these four questions Thank that we you. just received. Uh, first Economics. question, yeah. yes. First question was about uh, Europe's various uh, the progressive parties, I think, and and how they are differentiated from each other in terms of their internal culture. Um, yeah, how to think about the various uh, countries' progressive parties. Uh, the second question was about uh, specifically Christian Lindner, Germany's current finance minister, who was referred to in another podcast as uh, one of Europe's most dangerous people or the world's most dangerous people, how to think about uh, such a figure in historical context. Uh, the third question was about German reunification, uh, whether as a whole, although uh, uh, Adam didn't want it to occur at the time, whether we can look back on it as success. And the fourth question 
was um, from a recent high school graduate about uh, uh, the idea of studying economics and whether um, the academic study of economics is really um, sheds yeah light on on real world economics. Yeah. So I mean, I think uh, one of the reasons to do an economics degree is it's a kind of power degree. It's uh, you you you. You need to understand that that's what you're enter into, entering into, a highly ideological but quite powerful system. And so if you go in with critical intent, you need to go in with your critical you know, eyes open. And um, I mean, I stuck it out through the first degree, a very intensive English first degree, and then jumped ship after that. I couldn't deal with it um, and don't regret that. I also don't regret having taken the first degree, though, um, because, sure, there's a lack of realism, but... Um, you know, social analysis, trying to understand the world for me is always about trying to, it's not just as it were finding categories that fit, but constantly moving back and forth between categories at, at that don't fit and, and the reality that you're trying to grasp. And so that by itself doesn't disqualify economics. And, and um, you know, there's a proud tradition, um, many different traditions indeed, on, on the progressive side of politics that have engaged with economics in various ways. Um, and we've seen, you know, in the current moment, with extraordinary, you know, figures like um, Isabel Weber is the most obvious figure in this camp, who's turned a heterodox position into something according, something close to a mainstream position. Sort of risky move on her part. She's now taking a victory lap, uh, quite a few victory laps. Um, you know, celebrating her success in in doing that, and and uh, all power to her. So um, that's a, it's a good route. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting route to go, but it's one with risks and personal risks, psychological risks. I left because I didn't think I could hack it emotionally apart from everything else um i think it's probably still the thing i was best at intellectually but i just i just couldn't i couldn't ride it i should just qualify i mean i was not against german unification i mean that would be kind of but i you realize that that you realize at that moment what i was saying was i realized at that moment that it you know what i was what was brought home to me was that my hybrid identity was based in a West German sense, you know, that it was the particularly post-national version of Germanness that was open to my particular type of hybridity. And when, when this other type, you know, I still, my, you know, colleagues, you know, friends of my age keep having, you know, correct me all the time, though, you know, it's not Bundesrepublik anymore, it's Deutschland, Adam. Like, hmm. you know, that's not what we say anymore, that's not what the young people say. Hmm. Um, and, and, um, so I'm not, uh, I, you know, it's, it, it was obviously a historic chance. I mean, I, I think more interesting is the critique which says, you know, there should have been a constitutional refounding moment. This is the Habermasian position, right? That what, what was fatal in some ways was bolting the, the Neue Bundesländer into the constitution of West Germany, which created this very kind of an Anschluss, right? I mean, that's a polemical term, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, rather than a refounding. And the notion behind the Federal Republic of Republic's Grundgesetz, which is after all not a verfassung, was that it was supposed to open the door to the possibility of a proper foundational moment. And we sailed straight past that. And then a whole bunch of very complicated political economy decisions were taken, which also skewed the pitch. And um, Hart's fear and all of those, that the shrewder neoliberal turn, come out of the short-sighted decisions that were made in that early 90s moment. So it's become, but you cannot... I mean, talking about the East Coast Corridor of the United States, I mean, you cannot but admire the extraordinary way in which uh, a kind of unification, a convergence of basic living standards has been achieved across. Now, it's not complete, and I know social scientist Wolfgang Strake, amongst others, you know, founds his skepticism about various types of democratic capitalism in an analogy between the failed convergence, as he sees it, of East and West Germany and Mezzogiorno in Northern Italy, um, but I, I, I mean, you know, I'm a more, I'm more, more optimistic on that count. It seems to me, in some ways, a really remarkable success story. The incorporation of elements of the former Communist Party. You know, this is a, this is remarkable German politics. I don't, you know, I don't want to demonize Lindner. I mean, that was the, my, my, our point was not that he's the most dangerous man. Our point was this is a difficult structure that puts somebody of his politics in a dangerous position, makes him dangerous, if you like. Any liberal in that slot has to behave this way. I'm not, I know, the whole personalization of this, where we were the Schulden professor, and then he's like, whatever he is, the nice, the nice hawk, or he had this bizarre moment in Europe where he was trooping around and being very charming to people. I mean, I have no idea like, whether he's charming or not, or dangerous or not, but the structural condition 
of the German coalition, where you have a centre-right party bolted to two others, which is looking for votes and looking to stabilise itself. That's what's, that's what's dangerous, and that I was trying to historicise. We've had that before. It's a dangerous configuration. It's not the Liberals as such. I mean, the FTP has a proud tradition, notably in, you know, in the period that shaped my youth, <coughs> the Social Liberal Coalition of the, the 70s and 80s was a, was a dynamic modernising force of West Germany um, in many important ways, and part of that was then coming out of the FTP. There's also a different tradition that goes back to the national liberalism of the, of the mid-century, including, of course, the role of the FDP in the post-Nazi period. So complicated story. I would, as far as possible, want to move away from personalization as much fun as it is. Um, <laughs> and as, you know, as suitable a target as he is for satire in so many ways. Um, the the, the um, party, I mean, I'm your, your, political, your political actor, political operative, um, I guess the point I would... I would, I, and I don't have strong views about the internal politics. I mean, it's, of, it's very striking how differentiated they are, that they are still quite rich, the internal politics of parties in Germany. There are many societies in which the party system as such has collapsed. France is the most notable case of a political system riven by the fact that its parties have ceased to function as such. Um, but I think, I guess, what I would, what I would, what I would plead for is, I guess, continued engagement in them. I'm actually a little bit at sea on this question because I, as I sort of habitually, I don't vote anywhere. I haven't voted anywhere in a very long time mm -hmm. because of being multiply displaced and not a citizen of the United States. But it's generally a good thing to do. Hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing to be engaged in those parties. I'm privileged to work with them more as an advisor than, a, than, a, than as somebody who's actually on the front lines doing that grunt work. But it's, it was, I mean, I, you know, I referred fleetingly earlier on to my role in the, my, my experience in the, in, the, in the SWP. Being part of a political party is a, a powerful experience. I mean, it really engages you in politics in a very important way. And I, one of the things I like about the understanding of politics, democratic politics in West Germany since the war is that it emphatically embraces the significance of parties endows them with resources, creates the foundations, publicly funds them. And all of this, I think, is a really powerfully an important contribution to the health of, health of democracy. That's a rather anodyne note on which to end. But, <laughs> well, but we I should. mean, uh, it sounds like it. perhaps if there's another Trotsky party, you could be sure. persuaded <laughs> to, to come back into... <laughs> no, I, that's what I... Mm. Um, but I suppose it is uh, time for you to be whisked away to Maybrit Ilna's uh, studio. Um, so I suppose we do have to uh, wrap up here for now. Um, I do want to uh, thank uh, Podfest Berlin uh, and Prachtwerk, where we are right now, for uh, helping arrange uh, tonight's uh, show. Of course, thanks to Adam, uh, thanks to Rob uh, from FP's production team, uh, thanks to Dan, uh, our also local uh, podcast producer, and uh, thank you to everyone who's here uh, for coming out. It really, uh, we've been doing this now for, uh, it's just been a year and a half or so, but it's um, been really rewarding, specifically because of the feedback we get from everyone who, um, who listens. And uh, it's great to see everyone in person. And yeah, maybe we can actually figure out a get together. I don't know, uh, um, you know, there's still some time. Uh, um, so you're still in town for a little bit. So maybe we'll figure something out. Um, but anyway, um, Adam needs to leave right now. Um, thanks again to everybody. And uh, hopefully uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>